of what we do in the fifth year. It was here back in 2012. It's changed a great deal. Uh, you know, in January 1st of 2013, we were all required to register in a database. April 1st, 2013, we we're all required to query the database when we wrote prescriptions for our patients. We were here on March 31st, 2013, and the requirement to query came online uh, a day later. Two days later, we had an influx of calls saying, I didn't prescribe that. And you're very important in terms of looking at your own profile and calling us or the pharmacy and saying, hey, I didn't write for methadone. I think that was one of the largest concerns was they weren't putting down the right person on the prescription and the attribution was not correct. And it was pretty interesting because uh, when the pharmacist said they couldn't change it and then you called the board of pharmacy, it's amazing what a pharmacy investigator will do to facilitate changing your profile when they call on you. You don't want a pharmacy investigator in your pharmacy. So if you have any questions, please contact the board and, and Todd Bess's group. Last year, we stepped into trying to come up with a strategic map of what we do at the state of Tennessee to facilitate helping you take care of your patients. And we came up with four areas, five areas essentially that we can do. The fifth is from mental health and substance abuse. But first is to improve primary prevention. And that category we've been working on a great deal. Linda and Megan Martin have been working on that a great deal. And we're trying to target middle schoolers with virtual reality programs and teaching them how opioids work and, and what harms can exist, that sort of thing, an educational tool. Hopefully that later in the summer That'll be available to, to pilot, and by the time school opens in the fall, we'll have that rolling out in, in middle schools around the state to uh, try to teach kids more about opioids and benzodiazepines and overdose deaths, near misses, and that sort of thing. So category two is improved monitoring and surveillance. Dr. Bess is in charge of that committee and looking at how we can make the CSMD or the PDMP more available, more user-friendly to you. Uh, number three is to improve regulation and enforcement. Enforcement is not just from law enforcement, but it's also through the regulatory boards and assisting in educating people. One of the things we use a great deal is we actually use letters of concern and warning. And if you ever happen to get one, it's not an effort, it's not punitive, it's not even on your data profile, but if we see something that actually happens with a particular patient while coming to your clinic and was overlooked, we may send it a letter to you saying, we're concerned about this, please think about this. And one of the areas that we've sent some letters out recently was actually with buprenorphine and benzodiazepines. And we know that that is hard combination to break. But we, we do have in the guidelines, or will have in the addiction guidelines, comments on benzodiazepines along with buprenorphine, although we know that ultimately UASAM certified people are the leaders and deciders of what's appropriate for your patients. But we just try to let you know what your prescribing habits are in terms of if you have 200 patients and 199 of them are on benzodiazepines, that's probably a problem. But if you have maybe 25 on benzos, that's probably not a problem. So uh, that's what we use the letter of warning, letter of concern about. It doesn't rise to the level, level of discipline. We just let you know that it rose to the level of concern. Uh, the, the fourth category is increased utilization of treatment. And as you know, a great deal of money has come down the pike to mental health and substance abuse for treatment. Now, they just got several million dollar grant, but that's a drop in a bucket, you know, for treatment. Hopefully, we will rise above that 10% number of all the people who are, have opioid use disorders and increase the number of treatment slots that are available. And lastly, is increase access to appropriate pain medicine. Our goal is not to turn off the spigot for treatment of pain. Our goal is to make sure that treatment of pain is appropriate and readily available. 
and I think one of the things that I spoke at the Federation of Board of Medical Examiners two weeks ago in Dallas, and one of the things they were impressed with is having pain specialists as medical directors of our pain clinics, and having pain specialists, we have uh, made sure that at least we have someone managing that pain clinic that has board certification or at least certificate certification in ABPM to run that clinic. So we've gone from 333 pain clinics down to about 182, I think, last count. So that one provision made that difference. One of the things that happened last year was we were recognized as one of four states that have met five of the six criteria that uh, National Safety Council looked at as making great progress toward fighting the opioid epidemic. And number one was mandatory prescriber education. The legislature passed that bill, and uh, we felt at the Department of Health that not only did we say, okay, you guys have to have it, but we tried to provide at least a program in which you could use and move forward. It's, uh, so uh, that's why we're here. Number two is opioid prescribing guidelines. I'm proud to say we posted hours before the CDC by about a year, and we participated in producing the CDC guidelines. We disagreed with the CDC guidelines some, and some of the folks in this room, uh, we had about 45 people around the state that participated in our guidelines, and we had uh, Attorney Williams here, Tim Smythe, Steve Lloyd. So we had a, a good representation from this area that participated in writing the chronic pain guidelines for our state. Our second edition was just posted January 1st this year, and it's on our website. Number three, eliminating pill mills. I don't like that terminology, but we have reduced non-expert pain clinics, and so that we feel that we do have higher quality of pain clinics throughout the state. Number four is prescription drug monitoring program, PDMPs. We call ours the CSMD. Uh, we were one of the first states to do this as well when it was mandatory and required to be registered and required. For example, Dr. Bess will tell you that California has about 45,000 registrants. We have about 48,000 registrants in Tennessee. California's population far exceeds ours, so we're pretty pleased by having the participation. For example, actually looked at randomly about 300 individuals registered in the database, only 300 prescribers, and only three were not registered in the database. So that's a huge difference. When we first started and we had the top 50 in 2013, and five of the top 50 were not registered in the database. So we have, you know, one was a physician, one was a APRN, and one was a PA. But uh, we do have that. Then increased access to naloxone. What we didn't get credit for, availability of treatment for uh, opioid use disorders. Uh, but hopefully we'll have that much better this year. So if you look uh, in the yellow there, uh, New Mexico, Tennessee, Kentucky, and Vermont had five out of the seven or six criteria. So there are several states that didn't have any, like Missouri, Michigan. So we're moving along. I'm giving you the positive. One of the concerns is, is in spite of all the positive spins, overdose deaths continue to go up. So we'll have to talk a little bit about that and why in a few minutes. I put this out here so that you'll ignore me and try to download this CDC app. But the CDC app here is very valuable for you. And I have it on my phone, you, and you can uh, download it for free, and it will uh, do your calculations for you, and it also give you additional information about the CDC guidelines. It's a very valuable tool. It is a little bit different from what the C this CDC app is like the Washington State app. It is not the original CDC conversion table, so there's a little bit of difference. But overall, it's, one is rolling to the other, so they're really going to be the same. The difference was mainly in methadone conversion, and the other was fentanyl. But uh, they're getting there. But the CDC app is very valuable to you to look at your patients and see well, how many morphine equivalents are on. 
uh, we right away understood that counting prescriptions was not the way to go, but it's how much juice your patients are getting. And converting everything to a morphine equivalent to the level of morphine is the best way to go. A lot of people can criticize this conversion because it's not perfect. But as you know, nothing we do in the treatment of pain is perfect. Uh, I'm not criticizing your profession, Terry. It's just, uh, you know, sometimes it's an art and not a science. So the Prescription Safety Act in 2012 had these, uh, these findings saying that pharmacy and prescribers had to register. You had to query the database, pharmacy and dispensary reporting. We've now gone to near real-time data reporting from uh, dispensers to the CSMD. But I think one of the most valuable tools that we really don't realize is the method of payments on your profile when you print up from your patient. And the, if your patient is doing a lot of self-pay, two things can be happen. One is they can try to be hide, hiding things, but the other is we, as insurance companies, decide that they're not going to cover 180 oxycodone, they're only going to cover, say, 90. The patient may take insurance for 90 and pay cash for the other, so they'll have a, both a commercial and a self-pay component. The problem is that prescription is counted as two prescriptions, even though it was one, and sometimes our numbers in the state may not look as good compared to other states when you're counting prescriptions. So it's why morphine equivalence clearly is a better way to do that. So this again just says the Prescription Safety Act of 2016 is pretty much like 2012. There are a few changes, but the most important thing we had in the Prescription Safety Act that some states don't have is allowing you to have delegates so that you can have two unlicensed delegates to help you pull up your patient's data. I think that's critical. And uh, so the unlicensed, of course, if you have an RN or APRN or PA, uh, they, they all can look up because they're licensed uh, anyway. So unlicensed, like a, someone who's an office assistant, can look up under your number the, the patient that you might be seeing. Public Chapter 1033 is an important public chapter, and it's gone into effect partially already now, but the, the enormity of it will go into effect July 1st uh, this summer, and mainly it's changing pain management clinics uh, certificates to a licensure system. Number two, the medical director and not the owner holds the license. That it can be a sticky wicket because if the medical director decides to leave, you have an unlicensed clinic as an owner. So they're creating the rulemaking hearing. And Tony, I, I think you and Tim, if you've probably already seen the rules that have been promulgated, and I don't know when they're going to be meeting. Mary Catherine has been meeting with several of your representatives, and hopefully it'll meet with everybody's pleasure. But if it does, it's probably not a good rule. Uh, we've got to have a lot of argument and disagreement on both sides for it to be a good rule. Good rule, so... Now, remember that not everybody has to register as a pain clinic. If fewer than 50% of your patients are receiving an opioid or a benzodiazepine, people forget that benzodiazepines count in that number, then you don't have to register. Now, there is a provision in this pain clinic law that basically says that if the investigators come into the pain clinic and seize violations, they can shut you down, but not really. What they're doing is closing you down to any new patients while the investigation is going on, and you see your old patients. So we'll see how that goes. That was put in the law uh, and goes into effect 1 July. This just shows the decline in number of pain clinics when all the, the laws uh, were promulgated and required a medical director as a pain specialist. When I was speaking at the Federation of Boards of Medical Examiners, in Dallas-Fort Worth two weeks ago. New York is always uh, viewed as being a trailblazer fighting the opioid issues. But this uh, Dr. Green who uh, said, I don't know how you got your state to agree to this provision. I said, I think we were so bad that all the stakeholders got together saying, the doctors, the nurses, the PAs, the pharmacists, the legislators, the governors, 
says, we all recognize we're so bad that we agreed to certain things that we might have fought over in the past. Maybe if we get to that happy space, people would want to start uh, revoking some of these laws, but I hope not. I think we're in a good place. So this just shows that we're at 182 pain clinics in the state, and it shows you the, the scattergram of where they are around the state. This is an absolute number, uh, but if you look at actually pain clinics per capita, you'll see some of the smaller, more rural areas up along the Kentucky-Tennessee border, along the North Carolina border, and down uh, like Shelby County, for example, has nine pain clinics. Hamilton County in Chattanooga has 12. Uh, Washington County has seven. Sullivan County has eight. But if you did all that per capita, Knox County went from 39 pain clinics down to 18, but it looks like they're back up to 20. But uh, when you look at per capita, then those numbers are far more important. The other thing that's happened is when we started this effort in 2012, we peaked at 9.2 billion morphine equivalents of opioids, morphine equivalents uh, per year. And then we've been on a gradually declining number to where we're at 7.2 billion morphine equivalents. Now, if you look at the top 50 in 2012, and we published the top 50 in 2013, we were at 1.4 billion morphine equivalents in the top 50 and 9.2 billion in the state. So it's amazing what the top 50 can write for uh, out of the state's percentage. So that, that's continued to decline, but both numbers have declined. I find this rather interesting, too. If you look at the CS, uh, CSMD and look at your age distributions, because what we're trying to do is figure out how do people get in this fix. And we know that 85% of all heroin users start with prescription drugs. So you would think that if you focus on the young people, that you might uh, have a smaller training ground for people to switch to heroin. So if you look at these numbers, you can see the decline from 2011 to 16. In the 20 to 30 range, we have declined 64.5% in that age group. We've declined 20% in the 10 to 20 age group. But if you look at the older population, which tends to be growing in size, and this is an absolute number, those numbers are increasing, but that may also reflect hospice. It may reflect people who cannot have certain kinds of surgery, have contraindications. They may be on 40 morphine equivalents, not 400, uh, and have appropriate pain management. We haven't had time to delve into that, but it's a very interesting statistic that we do need to look into. So our, in spite of the numbers declining, this number continues to go up. Overdose deaths increased in 2015 to 1,451. That is a rate of, of uh, 22 per 1,000 popu 100,000 population. So that number is dramatically increasing. So why is that? If you look at this, you can see that the number is increasing here to 1,451. But if you look at any opioid, that's increasing. But these illicits have gone up dramatically. Fentanyl, heroin, and one thing that's not located on this is cocaine. If you look at West Tennessee, for example, 82 out of 242 overdose deaths in 2015 were cocaine. Now, granted, some of those were cocaine and heroin together. 81 out of the 242 also were associated with heroin. So what I'm doing is trying to show that uh, all problems are local, all solutions are local. Upper East Tennessee is far different from West Tennessee. This just shows you that the number one cause of overdose deaths in 2015 was oxycodone, oxymorphone associated with benzodiazepines. If you look at fentanyl, it's going up. But this number, for example, in Knox County in January of this year, there were 120 overdoses in one month. And most of those were due to fentanyl and heroin. So the face of an overdose is changing dramatically. What your coalition does here is far different from what it would have been in 2012. And Knox and Anderson County had about 
uh, 20 buprenorphine overdoses. And this is West Tennessee showing that uh, the cocaine and heroin. So overdoses are dramatically different. Most everything in here is a reason if you add these up, no one dies primarily of one drug. It's usually polypharmacy and an average of six drugs. And alcohol, uh, uh, you know, other things like marijuana uh, are in there as well. So people find many ways to kill themselves. One of the things we found that most heroin users uh, have used prescription drugs, but the drivers of heroin has to do with what we're selling or they're selling now is far different in purity than it was in the 70s. Secondly, the cost is nowhere near what it cost in the 70s, uh, although we've been getting some emails from Tim saying that the cost of heroin's going up. It may be because it's harder to get prescription drugs. Number three is the availability. It's available at any office, I think. You, you're selling it, aren't you, Tom? Okay. Uh, so this was an article I just brought out from the CDC, and they reviewed the characteristics of a fentanyl overdose 2014 through 2016. This is interesting. That's why I pulled it out and made a few slides on it. But 75% of the deaths, I would call them nice word, call them respondents, uh, observed fentanyl overdoses symptoms within seconds to minutes. That's how quick the fentanyl works. You know, the symptoms will include blue lips, gurgling, seizure, foaming, and confusion. It's almost immediate. And the demographics or the age group, we'll have to change the colors on this, blurred a little bit. Mainly the 15 to 34 age group, 73% were male out of the 196 deaths. And they were all non-Hispanic males. Fatal fentanyl overdoses primarily occurred in a motel, hotel, or a private residence. There was no naloxone present. And the individuals were not tested for carfentanil. The interesting thing about that is you really have to have it there. But the, the big deal is, is about what I was impressed with the article, is that most everybody, 25% snorted and died of an overdose. 75% were IV with fentanyl. And most all of them still had the needle in their arms. It acted so quickly, they didn't get the needle out. So... It just shows you what a bugaboo this drug is. This just shows you NAS has plateaued in our state about 1.31 per thousand live births, but the number is persistently high and is unacceptable. If you look at part of the curve here, 65% of the, all the, and it's, it's consistently this, 65 to 70% of all the NAS babies are under treatment. MAT treatment, whether it be methadone or buprenorphine. So the misleading thing every time we say is the treatment for addiction can cause neonatal abstinence syndrome. So you have to remember that. Another number we're finding is the non-opioid prescription substances. Gabapentin is probably the worst drug in terms of withdrawal for a baby with neonatal abstinence. It's probably... Uh, benzodiazepines worse than opioids, but gabapentin's worse than benzodiazepines. Something I wasn't aware of when we started in the uh, in 2012. This just shows you that the NAS rate per thousand live births in 2016 in the dark blue is uh, it's not ETSU blue. It's uh, just bad stuff in Upper East Tennessee, in East Tennessee where the NAS is far worse than if you look at Shelby County in West Tennessee, where cocaine is the drug of choice. But uh, it's a huge problem. Upper East Tennessee is the leader in this. We, we don't have the ultimate solution. You know, I don't know if Steve Lloyd's going to talk a little bit about uh, Craig Towers' article from UT Knoxville. And when they basically had a large group of people that were completely weaned off the opioids. They had no adverse outcomes, and, and both the babies and moms did well. He's still not been able to get 
the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology to endorse this large, the largest group of mothers and uh, NAS babies published and shows very good data. The second most important thing of his article says that the recidivism rate, the return back to drugs, is about 70 to 80 percent. But if you have good peer group uh, assistance and facilitation and working with the moms, that can drop as low as 30 percent. So treatment is very important, and it doesn't have to be opioid treatment, MAT treatment. That uh, peer group treatment is very important. This just shows you Shelby County, the rate is 2.0 per thousand live births. You come up to Sullivan County and it's 51 percent, Northeast 59 percent. So you can see the huge difference in the demographics of the state. So what you do to combat the opioid problem in East Tennessee is far different than what Shelby County does. So your coalitions are critical in working on all these issues. So what we found key in the legislative report is not only the 14% increase in overdose deaths, but, and Dr. Best may talk about this a little more, is 44% of those overdose deaths that died in 2015 had nothing in the CSMD. So the reason we have Linda here talking about ESPERT is to try to help you identify in your practices who might be the high-risk person to become so dependent to leave your care and go off the radar screen, not be in the CSMD, go to the streets, and taking illicits. That's changed dramatically. That number has, is going up 44% now. We don't know what it'll be next year. We do know that, what, 75% of uh, overdoses do have something in the CD in the CSMD in the in the entire preceding year, but people are dropping off and going to illicits. And illicit fentanyl is up 118 percent. Heroin's already with us and has gone up 17 percent. 33 percent of people dying from opioids also have taken benzodiazepines, uh, so that's a lethal combination. Should not do those two together. The drop not only was in the morphine equivalents overall, but the highest group, over 120 morphine equivalents, now has decreased by 40%. When the Chronic Pain Guidelines Committee got together, we decided 9120 based on the fact that we knew we didn't have enough pain specialists in the state to recommend referring those people over 90 morphine equivalents. So but that 120 upper number has decreased by 40%. So that's a good number. Dr. Shopping has declined. The real criticism there is, is I think we've created a better business model for Dr. Shoppers. They know that our surveillance is five pharmacies, five prescribers in 90 days. So now they go to the Kentucky-Tennessee border or the Virginia-Tennessee border and do 4 4 and 90 on each side of the state, and they know that we can't look on the other side. So the better business model now is 8, 8, and 90. They're making more money. So I'm not sure these numbers are as good as I think they are. But we're getting ready to do a study with the state of Kentucky where we look at that and identify data, link them. We're down to uh, one point, or about a billion morphine equivalents in the top uh, 50. That number has decreased, and we'll be doing the top 50 for 2016 soon. Public Chapter 30, we just published and posted the chronic pain guidelines. This just shows you the panels that came from all over the state. We're really proud of that. This is a list of names. I just threw them up here. They're so such fine print. You can't go after them and incriminate them. You can just come after me. You got to have good vision to see this slide. The CDC guidelines, I think I went over this with you before and I want everyone else to have a chance to talk. But the chapters in the CDC guidelines and ours are pretty much the same. I think what we emphasize is no telemedicine, and the other obvious thing is you need a history and physical. You need a diagnosis. Uh, we emphasize that. Chapter 2, 
We said no methadone and buprenorphine for treatment of chronic pain. We said 9120 instead of 5090 in terms of morphine equivalents. We emphasized the treatment agreement and informed consent. And then we had a women's health appendix. And the last part, we did not initially recommend MAT for opioid use disorders in our guidelines. That is in the new guidelines that we just posted. So urine drug testing should be done twice a year, but even monthly with high-risk populations. And I put this up here last but not least, and that is it's amazing we say in the chronic pain guidelines, if you have a woman of childbearing age, you should do a pregnancy test before you start him on opioids. It's not uncommon to see that they've not been tested. We were in Savannah, Tennessee talking last year and somebody was trying to argue that was a costly test, and then someone else got in a fight with them saying, no, well, it's only $3. That's not costly enough for a baby to be born with neonatal abstinence syndrome. And here's a listing and attachments, and these will be on your slides, which will be able to reach the legislative report and the Tennessee chronic pain guidelines. And we also have posted the pain clinic guidelines. Those are guidelines, not rules. Guidelines like what the pain... Chronic pain guidelines are not laws or rules. The rulemaking hearing for pain clinics will be coming up soon, and all of you should know about that. So I think we'll move on. I moved quickly through my slides so everybody else would have an opportunity to speak. I'm Linda. I'm the APRN. Who I'm going to talk about the ESPER. Is anyone here um, familiar with that acronym? A few of you? Okay. Before I get started, I want to talk a little bit about the opioid epidemic. And I know we've kind of all, this has been crammed down everyone's throat, and we see it on, in every newspaper, on TV. And I know you've probably heard how many die per day, per year. Everybody familiar with the numbers? Or are these new to you? You know them? Okay, well, let me give you an idea. 33,000, and these are last year's numbers according to the CDC. Um, we've had 33,000 overdose deaths last year. That is equivalent to 91 Americans dying every day. So if, if you've heard these numbers and, and they kind of are like, okay, it's out there, I'm trying to give you an idea and make this a little bit more personal, let's equate it to something that we do. Has anybody ever flown on a regional jet? Okay, good. 33,000 people dying from an overdose death. I know you've heard that. If you took a regional jet or a plane, 100 seats are on it. That would equate to be 333 planes. That would crash every year. So let's think about that. 330 plane crashes. If we heard about that, that would be pretty significant, right? Now let's think about it a little bit more. If we started crashing January 1st, do you know what day we would be free from airplane crashes this year? Take a guess. Come on, it's 330. How many days do we have? It's, I'm going to tell you, it's the Monday following Thanksgiving. So this Thanksgiving, the Monday following, when you go back to work, you can say no more plane crashes. All right? That makes it a little bit more personal. Now let's make it even more personal. Let's think about it in in the numbers of Tennessee. In Tennessee, we've had 15 crashes. That would, is what that would equate to. 15 planes have crashed from Tennessee. 14, they all die. That 15, half of them die. And that's how many overdose deaths we've had. Okay? So that makes it a little bit personal. I'm not going to give you a lot of numbers, but I am going to share with you just a little bit more. So Tennessee, how we are affected, and, and this is kind of going to segue into the SBIRT. If you will look, these numbers are from 2010, and I mean, these are recent. 
that have been published. So there's not a whole lot of numbers that, that I can get that are more recent. But if you look at these numbers, over 4 million need some kind of preventative strategy maybe mentioned to them. But 151,000 need early intervention. And that's why I want to talk about SBIRT. 69, we need to get them in to someone. They need treatment. So why SBIRT and why use it? So I want you to think, has anybody ever set a New Year's resolution in here? I want to lose weight. I want to work out more. I want to get healthier. OK, I know we all have. I want you to think about that addict or that near addict. Do you think that person woke up and said, I'm going to fall down the stairs, so I have to go to the doctor, get treated. They're going to give me a pain pill. And man, I want to become an addict. No, they do not think that way. But what happens? They do, right? And I can tell you, I had surgery a few years ago. I had a week's worth of pain pills that I had to take. I took them, and guess what? I got off of them. I had no problem. But there are individuals out there that take one pill, or maybe a couple days' worth of a pill, and then they can't put it down because it makes them feel so good. And think about that when we think about SBIRT. And this is something that we really need to try and capture, these individuals, and do something about it. So SBIRT, screening, this is the acronym, screening, brief intervention, referral to treatment. OK? So what is that exactly, the screening? Now, SBIRT has several different screenings. But you can do a pre-screen as well and try to do a universal screening. And we're going to go into all those. But screening is real quick, a few minutes. Brief intervention, again, brief interventions. We want to capture those and try to motivate them towards a behavioral change. Five to 10 minutes, OK? That's what it takes. That's it. And then we want to identify those who need referral to treatment. So SBIRT, we got to think differently with SBIRT because it's not one of those prevention, and it's not one of those total treatments. Like, I'm going to just tell them a couple things, and then I'm going to either send them, you know, punt, send them to somebody else to fix them. It's something that we can do. It, and it doesn't take very much time. It kind of uh, is like a, in the crosshairs, or I shouldn't say that. I'm married to a police officer. It's kind of like a go-between, in between the two extremes. And it's something that we can implement very easily. What is the aim for SBIRT? Well, we want to try and catch those individuals who are at high risk and get to them before they go to the extreme. We want to try and prevent that addiction. Who should do it? Everyone should do it, really. SBIRT is something that I'm working on towards my doctorate. So I've read a lot of articles, and I can tell you that primarily the primary cares and the emergency departments are doing it. But if you're in another field, and if you feel like you can work this into your practice, you know, I encourage you to do so. OK, very good. Um, SBIRT, so SAMHSA initiated this effort for SBIRT in 2003. They've had about 1.5 million persons screened. Their outcome, what they found, 40% reduction. Now, SBIRT was originally designed for alcohol. So these stats are predominantly showing the difference for alcohol treatment. So 40% reduction with risky drinking. And then they also had stats about reduction for negative consequences socially. Not to say that they're not doing this for opioid treatment and, or opioid addiction or drug addiction or illicit addiction. So there, there are studies going on currently, right now. And what they're finding is a positive response as well. 
and I've got a little bit of stats for that. This is predominantly about the drinking. So if you'll see, there's 70, you know, in typical screening, 71%, they didn't need anything. This area, 25%, they needed that intervention. I mean, if, it's huge. If we could catch 25% of this population and prevent them from going to that 4%, you know, where they need to get treatment, we could make such a difference in this addiction. Okay, so can, um, we've heard from Dr. May, can we put it in our clinical setting? Of course you can. What does it do for you? It's going to heighten your awareness about your patients because if you start thinking like that, you're going to start asking a couple questions here or there about, you know, it, well, if you imp implement it, you certainly are asking questions. But if you do not, maybe you'll be more aware after tonight that there could be a possible substance use. But we definitely want you to try and implement it. It makes you more aware and it gives you the framework to go down that road of asking those questions without coming off judgmental. The process. You're going to start with the screening. If they're low risk, there's nothing more to do. Moderate to moderately high, you're going to do that brief intervention. Severe, you're going to refer them. Pre-screening. I want you to think about, here we got the plane situation again. Think about TSA. When we go to get on a plane, we get screened. Well, think about this as a pre-screen, because what happens if it, the beeper goes off? You have to stop, you get a more thorough screen. Well, that's pretty much what SBIRT's all about. If you're in a practice setting with a front desk, they check in, and part of all that paperwork we always have to pay, uh, fill out, uh, the HIPAA and all that, we can give them a pre two question questionnaire about their use. This is kind of what it looks like. This is not a great picture, but it was one that I found on our Tennessee website. But it asks two questions. Do you drink? And then have you used drugs? So it pretty much is very simplistic, easy to do. If they're, if they're positive, then you go on to the next step. If they're negative, that's it. It's that simple. So the rationale for this universal screening, well, drinking and use of drugs is more common than we think. It can increase the health problems, as you all are aware, and it often goes undetected. But believe it or not, when that patient sits down in that chair, sits on the examination table, they're probably more apt to talk to you about this in this problem. And, you know, you would be surprised that, that they would be more open to our um, counsel. So are the decision tree, so they went to the front desk, they filled out that screening, and they're negative, they keep going. But if they're positive, there's a couple tests that you can provide. I've provided a big list of different screenings out there. But the ones we're going to talk about is the audit, DAS, and assist. OK, those are the three biggies. So the audit test is the alcohol use disorder identification test. It consists of 10 questions. It takes just a few minutes. Self-administered, or if you have a language barrier, or if you have a population that does not have a reading comprehension, you can have your nurse or assistant administer it prior to you coming in an examination. Or if you want to be the one that does that, you can do that as well. So this primarily looks at alcohol use. The results is on this card. And I know um, I've attended some uh, expert training. You can get a pocket card even so that you can utilize it and, sh and use it as a teaching tool as well. But it tells you. Um, you know, depending on their score, what a drink really looks like, okay? I want you to look at this bottom ruler because I'm going to talk about it in a few minutes, okay? The DAS-10, it's a shorter version from the DAS-28. 
Um, it contains 10 questions, same thing, self-administered. These are the questions that it has on the test. Okay, have you ever used drugs? Do you abuse more than one drug at a time? Um, you know, it can go through the whole gamut there. I threw out some Tennessee stats just to give you an indication of what has happened. These are on our website, and I'm going uh, at the very end of my uh, PowerPoint, I have posted all of those um, websites for you all. Uh, but as you can see, Tennessee has increased its use from 2011. Well, I mean, since 2009, it's had a steady increase, but it really took an up, upsurge around 2012 for those seeking uh, treatment for opioids and heroin. Okay, so assist. That's kind of a combo of both. And uh, it's going to ask question, several questions. Um, eight questions, but you're going to see in a minute, it's not just eight questions. There's a lot more to the questions, but again, when I've read literature, I haven't done it myself, but the test can usually take up to 10 minutes. Um, you've got a scorecard. It helps you with feedback, and so it will help you with your intervention if needed. This is an example of the first question. Okay, and so as I said, it's going to ask very specific questions under one, and then it, and it walks you through. But you can find this anywhere if you want to look online, but I'm also going to include resources. If you want this implemented, I'm providing you the resources so that you can bring it to your office. So the screening, what we've done is we've started at the front desk. We did the pretest. The medical assistant nurse uh, takes the patient to the room. If it's positive, they're going to go ahead and administer that second test. Now, I do have to say, if you provide the audit, DAS, or assist test, there is an ICD-10 for it, so you can charge for it. If they're not positive, no further activity needed. So they, they do the test under, um, you know, your nurse or your assistant can provide it. And then the, the physician's going to come in, sit down, review the test with you. And then with implementation, which is the next thing, we're going to do the, the brief intervention. So that's what we're going to walk through. The brief intervention, the practitioner sits down to, to discuss. So basically, there are four steps to it. And it shouldn't take that long to do. Ten minutes is what they're saying. Raise the subject, provide feedback, enhance motivation, negotiate, and advise. It may take up to 30. But it's going to really depend on how open and motivated that individual is. Brief intervention, number one, raise the subject. Would it be okay if we discuss the results of your screening test? Basically, what you want to do, you do not want to come off accusatory. You want to try and create that collaborative relationship. Okay? Number two, provide feedback. In reviewing the screening results, I noticed that you were blank and at a level that may be harmful for you. How do you feel about this? So your open-ended questions. You're wanting to elicit them to see how motivated they are to discuss this, this potential problem or this problem. And then step three, explore and enhance the motivation to change. Would it be all right if I asked you a few more questions about alcohol drug use? And then on a scale zero to 10, how motivated are you? And so that is where this little ruler it comes into play. Okay, and you can use that. Zero is not at all, and 10 is extremely. So then you can, you know, continue to pursue about the discussion about that. Negotiate a plan. Um, if the you know, patient's ready to talk, what changes would you like to make? How could you uh, go about making these changes to be successful? Try to get them as motivated and as involved in that conversation as possible. If they're not ready to talk about it, 
what are some of the warning signs that you could look out for would indicate this alcohol has become problematic. And honestly, um, don't you think if they say they're not motivated, the next time they take that drug or alcohol, they're going to think about your conversation? I would think so. So some of the findings, six-month follow-up, has found that illicit drug use has dropped by 67%, and alcohol has dropped by 38%. That's huge. That's huge. 12-month follow-up, you still have a reduction. No matter what, it's going to do some good. No matter what. So the last step in this decision tree is referral to treatment. You want to make sure, and I'll tell you, SAMHSA says you've got to have that referral to treatment in place before you know, implementing this, because this is crucial to have somewhere to go and, and be able to refer them to. And you know, the goal to refer the treatment is to help them get to where they need to be and engage that patient in the treatment. So, referral to treatment, the patient is ready to seek treatment. So, treatment services, you're going to tell them what treatment services are available, and hopefully you can help set that treatment up before they leave the office. Okay? Referral to treatment if they're not ready to speak and talk about it and seek it. Go ahead and provide the resources, because like I said, if they didn't want to talk to you in that brief intervention, and they don't want to seek treatment when you want to refer them. I think if you just raise the ideas, the questions, the conversation, I think when they, and if you continue to see them, eventually it's going to hit home. And hopefully they will take that step. So go ahead and provide that information. So I'm going to provide you with some of the tools if you want to implement it into your practice setting, you know, you need to make sure you can you have staff on board that want to do this. Um, I'll tell you, I've read a lot of things. I've talked to a lot of people. We've got such a negative um, attitude. Um, a lot of healthcare providers do. And I've worked in the ER for a long time, and, and I've seen it. We've got to change that attitude about addicts and not just you know, criticize them and, and look down on them. We need to help them. I bet almost every one of you could, you know, at least touch somebody that has been affected by this epidemic. So try to get your staff on board. Get them in the, the right mindset about it. And then you can, I'm going to give you the resources for Esbert, Tennessee. And you can get free training, free items. You just gotta, you just gotta do it. We do have um, Esbert on the um, telephone as well if you need that. State resources. So we do have recovery support. We have so many resources. I didn't realize it. And if you go on the Tennessee Department of Health, there, I, I didn't even put half of them up on my slide. But recovery support, pregnant women with SUD, adult substance abuse treatment. Crisis detoxification, and then of course the Tennessee Red Line. Um, substance abuse training. There is the website. If you just Google it, you'll find it. Um, fast facts. I love this. I'm just a nerd at facts anyway. I like to read about all this stuff. Um, it has all of our stats for the state of Tennessee. It's incredible the information they collect. There's even a, a Tennessee epidemiology report. It's fascinating. So, you know, get a copy of this. Look at these. It's amazing how much um, is out there in, in the resources, for resources and for just raw numbers if you're curious. This is my information. We've put some cards out there as well. So please feel free to reach out. We'll help you get set up. And that's it.
Dr. Mutter uh, wanted me to kind of uh, talk to you a little bit more about the uh, overdose death finding for 2015, and that being 44% of the overdose deaths, uh, they had a negative controlled substance monitoring database report 60 days prior to death, even though three-fourths of the people have something that year prior to death. And so that is trending up. And what I wanted you to think about is, uh, I think there's a consensus that the CSMD report is valuable if there's lots of information in it. But I would like for you to consider, if you work in an ER setting and you have a patient who has a non-fatal overdose and they have a negative report and no prescriptions being filled in the last 60 days, I want you to be thinking about it's not going to be easy for you to be talking to someone about changing a treatment plan because that patient is disconnected from the healthcare delivery system, it, it would appear at that point, and so you're going to have to have a different conversation with them. I'm going to get started here and um, just uh, wanted to uh, give you a little news flash. Currently, we are on the old Optimum platform. Uh, Optimum Technologies was bought out by APRIS, and uh, we're still on the old platform. We have not migrated to the new AWARE platform that they have, and that'll happen sometime probably early 18. Their login is going to be your email address, and we realize we've got some email challenges, and some of you probably have never gone into the CSMD and looked at my account to make sure your email address is accurate. And you've got to have an email address that only you have access to, it's only assigned to you, and you protect your credentials to, to get to that. But when we migrate, if you don't have a current active email address in my account, you're going to get left behind. And the law requires you to be registered, the re law requires you to check, and so you're going to be in a bad situation. So I just beg you to go in there and update your information. We sent out emails to uh, physicians not long ago, and 2,000 of them bounced back to us as bad email addresses. So that's kind of how big the problem is. The other thing that this will do to allow you to get alerts about your patients that are high risk, it's going to allow you to get uh, communications from the CSMD on various things. And hopefully in the future, now that we're getting non-fatal overdose data from hospitals, perhaps you would be getting alerts on patients that you have or, or that are, have had non-fatal overdoses so that maybe you can take better care of them. So just a Important thing, I don't want you to leave tonight without really making that a priority. I'd like to celebrate the folks on the CSMD committee. They work really hard to, and look at who's on here from uh, your discipline to be sure you're communicating with them on things that uh, you would like for them to voice at our meetings that we have. And this group and the Chronic Pain Guideline Expert Panel, I think, have served the state very well in the last few years, but this is the current membership. Dr. Mutter reminded you if you are taking care of patients more than 15 days a year, you've got to be registered. So you can see why it's so important for you to get prepared for the migration to the new platform. This is a case that uh, we came across recently, and I shared this one with you because this was a patient that was dentist shopping. And this patient went to, in a 90-day period, went to 89 different dentists and got prescriptions and they were also going to multiple pharmacies. None of these prescriptions would have bumped up against the required check because it was less than a seven-day supply. The patient had legitimate need for pain medicines for their dental problem, but they would call back and say, "My, you know, uh, this made me nauseated, or can you give me something stronger? This didn't work. But you can see what they were able to do. And so you think about how we have such a problem with these drugs being diverted and shared with other people, all the overdoses out there. If we've got 44% of our overdoses and 15 that didn't have anything in the database 60 days prior, they're getting it from somebody. If this person would have been diverting drugs, then you know there's a lot of dentists and pharmacists that participated in that without people really looking at the database closely to see that we had an obvious problem here. So it's not just... Uh, what we think about people going to primary care providers and ERs, dentists are another group that's being shopped. The uh, Prescription Safety Act 2016, just want to remind you of the changes. 
that went into place, and Dr. Mutter covered that, but basically, anytime you see something suspicious, regardless of which schedule or which class drug, you as a prescriber now have to check, like the pharmacists have had to check since 2012 for that. And then they have to check before they start dispensing opioids and benzos to new patients to their practice. And so they're being treated similar to you. Do we have any CRNAs in the, in the audience tonight? Uh, how many of you work in a place that does procedures? The CRNAs come in. We now have, we saw a gap in the law. CRNAs usually don't have DEA numbers, and they did not have access. And so we were able to uh, get the law updated. We were able to get with our vendor, APRIS, and get that role created so now that CRNAs can register in the database. And we really want people checking patients before they have uh, procedures done. Uh, I know there's been, Dr. Lloyd was sharing with us recently, he knows of a lot of patients that have had post-op seizures from benzodiazepine withdrawal because the hospital didn't know they'd been getting the benzodiazepines prior to admission, and then post-op, they end up getting in trouble. So I think that's going to be something that's going to drive up the quality of care. If we can get CRNAs, we can encourage them to go in and, and register. The daily reporting that we now get to enjoy since January makes this information more timely, and so I hope that that's something you've noticed, that it is greater value to you because you're seeing more timely information in the database. And the law did change. Remember, we have veterinarians that their prescriptions are being reported, and so they, if they're a veterinary dispenser, they have a little extra time, so there will be a lag there for those prescriptions in the database. How many of you are a prescriber dispenser? Raise your hand. In your practice dispenses. You guys have uh, had uh, two public chapters signed in the last two years. You really know, but need to go back and review 63-1-154 because there's a ton of things you now have to be aware of and it's more than just you know, you, how you report that to the database, but also the other things you're required to do. So I'll let you review that. Just looking at one of these public chapters would probably confuse you, but you need to look at the current law. If you are those that just raised your hand, Remember our data collection manuals on our website. You can go in and see what your required fields are so that you can be in compliance with the reporting requirements. And you can see we're up to close to 50,000 people. That's a lot of people's accounts to migrate over to this new platform. And so we really don't want anybody to be inconvenienced when that happens. Uh, early 18 would be the earliest date that this would happen. Remember your delegates. If you don't have your delegates, whether they're licensed or unlicensed, registered. Once again, I just finished traveling on the weekends to eight stops across the state to talk to pharmacists and reminding them that they're underutilizing their pharmacy technicians. And so you know what kind of opportunities you may have in your practice that would really help you be able to do things a little more efficient. Once again, this past year, our Prescriptions going in the database, two and a half prescriptions roughly going in for every time someone checks. You can see the improvement we've had. And so that's fewer and fewer prescriptions being prescribed and dispensed without somebody looking at the information. And so I think that this is becoming critical to you all being able to take care of your patients. And I think that ratio really il illustrates that. Remember also, if you have a nurse practitioners, your nurse practitioners and PAs have to be registered in the database, and then you have to go and approve them. And uh, that went into effect around the beginning of 15, I think it was, when it had to be uh, completed. And so you need to look at our FAQ questions 35 through 37 if you still have questions about that. And remember, that's what's driving the Department of Health license verification website so that when you pull up a nurse practitioner, you can see who is supervising them by clicking that bottom link there for supervised relationships. Just want to remind you again of the report, because currently you're getting to enjoy the clinical risk indicators, the flags at the top left, and then the box, the rectangular box here that takes all the active MME and tells you what your daily MME is for all your scripts. And also remember to keep paying attention to your payment code, the far right column, so that you can see which patients are getting cash payment, and I've reminded you again that that would be 01. Also, I 
remind you to look at your patients that are workers' comp, they've been injured, and they may have some O1s mixed in on their report, and maybe you can help them upstream if they're starting developing some drug-seeking behavior. So uh, one of the things I'd like to update you on tonight, I'm trying to uh, share a lot of new information with you. In the past, we had a prescriber dashboard turned on, but it was bombarding you guys with emails, and there was a lot of alert fatigue. And so we've been working with APRS to try to figure out how to do this in such a way you could benefit from us pushing information out to you, but you not being bombarded with a lot of emails. And so what we're going to do, we're going to have APRS turn that back on, and when you log in, you'll see these notifications, and there will be up to 25 patients, and you can see where the red font is. That will be the patients that are bumping up against five or more prescribers five or more dispensers, MME greater than 120, for example. And those would start hitting first, and it would fill in with some of the yellow flags after that. And you would get this thing refreshed on, say, midnight, Sunday night. And then early in the week, Monday, you'd be getting an email pushed out to you to let you know you actually have some new information in your dashboard for you to look at. And if you uh, wanted to see all 25, you would click... Underneath the red font, you can see that little section. You would be able to click and see all of them at once. But I think that that will help you all. And so we're wanting to be more proactive at doing some analytics for you so that some of these patients may not be scheduled back to see you for some time. At least you would be able to see if something's currently changed or all of a sudden they started reaching out to a lot of other prescribers. And so I hope that that will work better than what uh, we had for you in the past. I know a lot of you pull this practitioner versus peer report, and, and it's, I call this kind of the, the prescriber report. And currently, as you know, it's limited to the number of prescriptions that you have written and comparing that to your peers. And this would be other family medicine practitioners that you're being compared to. And so we are working with APRIS currently, and this is where I want you to pull out that questionnaire in question number three. And I want to show you what this will look like. It's almost overwhelming with the opportunity we have to share information with you. If you share with me and there's a consensus that there's certain things you just don't want to see, we'll try to have that ignored. But I want to walk through this with you a little bit. Up on the top, you'll see that it's going to give you your, for the last six months, it's going to give you a report that would be available to you quarterly. And it's going to give you your number of patients that you prescribed opioids to and then the number of opioid prescriptions. So if you're a physician, it's going to compare you to other physicians, but it would also compare you to, say, other family medicine practitioners. And then we drop down, and it's going to take uh, MME, and it's going to break it down into these different groups I have listed for you, less than 50, 50 to 90, and so on, and up above 200. And you'll see, you know, how many prescriptions by MME you've written during that period of time and how you compare to your peers. And then we would drop down to treatment duration. So you get to see your patients in the last six months. How many of them, those were less than seven days and seven to 28, and then on up to 90 and then greater than 90. And so that would give you a comparison of how many you know, chronic patients you have versus other people that are similar to you. And then we go down to your prescription volume. And you could see where it would give you your volume of oxycodone, hydrocodone, and so on. And then you would get other information available. Uh, it would eventually get down into the sedatives and it would tell you the number of prescriptions for the sedatives, and that would be your benzos and other sedatives, and it would compare you to your peers. And then, and I don't know how valuable this would be on the sedatives, but you would get over there to where it would actually give you dosage units, and I'm not so sure uh, if that would be that valuable to you. This box right here would tell you your top three drugs that you prescribe, and then we would also get into your combinations of whether or not you prescribed 
uh, opioids and benzos together, or if you had prescribed at least one of those drugs and other people had prescribed the rest, you would get feedback on that. And then we would also add in Soma with that. So you would get opioid benzodiazepine plus Soma in there. Other things that you're going to see down at the bottom of this report, you're going to see multiple provider episodes. It would tell how many of your patients are seeing greater than five physicians, how many of them are seeing greater than five pharmacies. And then you'll get information on how many times you query the database. What is your monthly average there? What about your delegates? How often are they querying the database? And so you would get that kind of feedback. And so this is all new. You can see we're getting ready to potentially expand this way beyond what you currently have access to. But we're hoping it will help you. And also, I'd like for you to just think about some of those options I've just listed so that you can kind of tell us what you would value the most and what you'd value the least and so on. So I'm going to keep moving so we can get you out on time. There's a lot of interest in interoperability. Pushing the prescription monitoring program information into eHealth and so APRIS has created uh, a process to allow that to happen, but currently there's no way for you as the end user to clean up the data. And so all of your analytics that we run for you would be wrong if you could not remove patients that were inappropriate for your report. So I'd like for you to see what APRIS has told us that they hopefully will be able to have in production about the time that we go to the new platform, and so this would be their proposed e-health solution. This would also be available in pharmacies and in their software systems. But what you see when you pull up the report, it's going to look a little bit different than what you currently see. The new AWARE platform is going to look similar to this. This would be the e-health view. And you can see we've got four patients that this report's made up of, and there's this individual, Bobby, that we would like to remove because we don't think that it's appropriate for that individual to be included in this report. You can see over here where you currently enjoy the pick list where you control on the front end, this would be kind of like a reverse pick list. Instead of including people, you're removing people. So you would click remove. You can see that it would light up for you and you want to remove and reproduce your report. Then APRIS would want, and it would probably be a drop-down boxes here, two or three, where you could communicate back to APRIS to tell them why you're removing Bobby. Once they see this is a chronic problem where that individual has been included in the clustering, then their system could learn to remove that to where other people, including yourself, would not see that in the future. And then you would just click to rerun the report, and now you can see there's only three individuals making up that report. That would correct all of your analytics to make sure it's accurate at that point. And so we think this is a huge improvement over the off-the-shelf solution that they had asked us to consider. And so this looks like where we're headed. We are very pleased with what they've done here. And we think that that will allow us to have easier access to the information, but without sacrificing quality of the information. So appreciate you being patient with us as we've tried to work with them and help them understand what we need them to do. Other thing I wanted to share with you, the clinical risk indicators, currently they've not committed to having our flagging system, our red and yellow flags, but it would be still up toward the top of the report and you would get just text describing to you what you need to be concerned about on the report. But more to come on that part and hopefully they'll have it to where it's much easier for you to spot I want to celebrate this with you because the law was changed in spring of last year and you guys as prescribers were supposed to start checking when you saw things that were suspicious and that's now your number one reason for checking the database and keep in mind planned surgery Dr. Mutter he still got that on his radar he's wanting you to get that bar up so that uh, and we think we're going to allow that to happen with you encouraging CRNAs up here in East Tennessee to start signing into the uh, database. So tomorrow, I'm expecting to see a lot of CRNAs from this area registering for the database. And the pharmacy folks, you can see their number one category now is the new patient. And so we've really been working hard to get the word out across the state. Last fall and then 
uh, earlier this year. And so I'm really proud of how you all responded to that legislative change. And a little update on data sharing. We just added Alabama recently, Georgia. We're getting close to being able to share data with them. And, you know, we have South Carolina, Virginia, West Virginia, and Kentucky for you guys over here. North Carolina, we've actually, Tommy Farmer and Dr. Mutter and I met with an uh, individual from their AG's office and their PMP director over there at the uh, drug summit in Atlanta uh, a couple weeks ago. And uh, I really felt like they were committed to really getting serious about sharing data with their neighboring states. This is uh, just feedback on how you guys are changing your treatment plan with this information and how the pharmacy folks are not filling prescriptions as they were written. They're having that communication with you all. Lots of good, rich dialogue. You can see our overall prescriptions are trending down. And maybe Tommy, uh, on these drug take-back days, won't have to have such big trucks to haul it off, but he was just showing me some pictures. It's amazing what they took back Saturday. And just overall, you can see our opioids for pain are trending down. Buprenorphine for opioid use disorder trending up. I'm going to show you some neat stuff with the benzos, but the stimulants, we've got a 50% increase on stimulants. And I know the legislature is looking at that, and they're very concerned, and I hope you guys are concerned as well. We do know stimulant abuse is going up, and based on information we heard at the drug summit. But here's our stimulants. And are you surprised that every age group is trending up, even this 60 to 69 group? And so I just want you all to understand the growth in the stimulants is just not in the younger population. It's in all these age groups. And so really start to pay more attention to those. You're not mandated to check the database on stimulants, but I think we really need to be paying closer attention there. Benzodiazepines, look at this uh, progress you all are making. As a class of drugs, it's hard to appreciate it, but you can see the younger age groups, you're starting to see some really nice declines. And then over in the... Uh, Older age group, you know, the risk is going up there for all those negative outcomes that we're all aware of with benzodiazepines. And then when we look at the data Dr. Mutter shared with our older populations having this growth with opioids in the last few years, you can see that in combination with the benzos, we really have some serious concerns with our elderly population in the state. And Dr. Mutter showed you the MME coming down for the opioids, but notice this tremendous decline we're seeing with the long-acting, and your short-actings are still declining, not like the long-acting agents, but it's not like the short-acting are taking the place, and so I think that's good news for us. I know Linda just shared a wonderful presentation for you on SPERT, and then you combine that with the CSMD report, and 39% of you told us in December when we did our annual survey that you're referring more patients over to treatment. And I know that Dr. Lloyd Mental Health is trying to work hard to address your capacity for treatment, especially up in this part of the state. So uh, if you have really tough situations, you need to let them know uh, so you can partner with them and they can help improve things in this area with the resources they're starting to get. And just reminding you, the buprenorphine that's going to you, opioid use disorder, you can see even in the older age groups, it's increasing each and every year. And you've got the cluster, and this is taking you from 2010 all the way through 16, like those other graphs did. A little bit about naloxone collaborative practice agreement. You know, you think about pharmacists having collaborative practice agreements with prescribers. That's a lot of agreements for one pharmacy to keep up with. And so what we've done uh, we've tried to speed up the process of getting these new products out there in the hands of people in your community that are at risk for overdose. And you can see those two products, just a little ideal. I had folks over at Mental Health tell me if they were to purchase this for their institutes, this one where you get two doses, an auto ejector, it's almost $4,000 their cost. And then this one, if you're a government entity or a not-for-profit uh, you can get that for $75 is what they told me at the drug summit for two doses. And then everyone else would have to pay close to $125 just to get the two doses in, in the uh, nasal spray. A little update on what the costs are looking like and I hope that we can 
uh, drive that down, but a little bit about the collaborative practice agreement option that you have in your community. I've just traveled with the Board of Pharmacy, and we spent an afternoon with pharmacists on the weekends across the state, and they're all aware of this. It was passed last year, Public Chapter 596. And so what we have is an opportunity for Dr. David Reagan, our Chief Medical Officer, Department of Health, for him to be that person that has authorized the pharmacist to prescribe and dispense naloxone to people that would benefit from it, possibly. So what I would like to ask you to do tonight is talk to the pharmacies in your area. And some of them are already doing this, but if you have patients you're concerned about, you would like to tell them which pharmacies close by could help out, check with those pharmacies. And if they're not doing this, I would ask you to strongly encourage them to get uh, the information together. It's very straightforward. All the information any pharmacy would need is on the Department of Health website, which I've given you a link for, all the training materials and other resources. And, and then they would be able to get an agreement signed with Dr. Reagan, and they simply would just fax that over to the Board of Pharmacy, and they would be good to go. So if you have questions, you feel free to call us at the Controlled Substance Database or Board of Pharmacy, but I think the best place for you to have conversations with the pharmacy down the street and be able to better serve your community, and then maybe we can start driving down these overdose deaths across the state. In conclusion, I think we're very encouraged at the Department of Health that things are uh, looking better, and we're very concerned about the overdose death problem not going down but climbing like it is, but at least we're starting to understand that a little bit better, and we understand just how much heroin and acetyl fentanyl, all of those fentanyl analogs, how dangerous they are in our communities and how they're starting to become a leading cause of a lot of these overdose deaths. And the thing we keep hearing, even if it's a heroin overdose, there's a lot of prescription drugs mixed in with that. And so you still could be providing care for a person and prescribing these high-risk medications. And they're also getting heroin or some other diverted drug on the street. And so I just think we've all got to work together and we've got to communicate and as we're learning to try to share that quickly. And that's what we're trying to do tonight is to update you on as much as we can. Please get some communication started in your area about the naloxone collaborative practice agreement that uh, Dr. Reagan has now with the uh, pharmacist across the state of Tennessee. A very simple process that may save a lot of lives in your community and across the state. And so I appreciate you allowing me to update you tonight. And we want to keep you on schedule. So I'll Scoot over for Tommy. All right, I'm going to give you a quick we'll follow the trend with what uh, Dr. Best was just talking about and spend the majority of the time talking about the, uh, the fentanyl. We'll skip through these stats. I'm going to want to go past this one. I do want to remind you one thing. Uh, number one, the four factors that are affecting all drug use. What we find, it's the price availability, perception of risk, and the public attitude about the drugs. And it doesn't matter which or what we apply that to. From my experience in, in law enforcement, this is going to impact the, uh, the drug use. Just to continue, we're making a lot of progress. This gives you a good indication. It's very difficult for you to see it, but the maps there are the heroin trends as they're moving across the state. And then, of course, the the yellow bars and the red bars, those are the overdose deaths, and I've just depicted them just a little bit different. Yellow being uh, opioid analgesic, the red being combined. That's the heroin. And where our concerns are, if those individuals that are coming off of or transitioning from opioids, we want them to transition into treatment is what we want them to do. <clears throat> uh, these are just forensics testing of the different drugs that are being submitted to our our clan, our, our uh, laboratories across the uh, state, our forensic labs. This gives you an idea of the drugs that we are seeing. By year, you can see buprenorphine, obviously, the amounts that law enforcement are seizing on the streets and then seeing for analysis are going up, and they have gone up across the state, but also oxymorphone, oxycodone, morphine. And what we're finding with many of these is, is what Dr. Best said. They may be submitting them in, but we're finding 
uh, those drugs that are made in compressors, pill labs. So the caution to you is you may get something, and I'll give you some examples here in just a minute, show you some of them. Uh, you may be getting, if you're doing pill counts, please use gloves or some protective equipment because you don't know if the oxycodone or the Percocets or the Mepergans or whatever you're counting or having them bring back into count are the ones that came from the pharmaceutical company. They could have come from a makeshift lab. We are seizing them left and right. And I'll give you a couple of examples of that. Uh, and they are containing all types of things. Uh, Pizlazam uh, is one of the drugs that we have received. We've seized up in this area, which is a, a fake Xanax. Uh, seeing it it's coming out of China, fentanyl, different various types of the analogs of fentanyl. So this is just a good example of the drugs that, that we're also seeing that are coming in. <clears throat> Drug toxicology is, again, uh, uh, just another example of those. Those are individuals either through a crash or some reason, if it's a, a murder, homicide, or something of that nature, the toxicology is being submitted to us. You can also see the presence of these drugs as well. And then paying particular note, you can't really see this. And I said I was going to use this. I always wanted to use this in class. Yeah. Uh, you've heard, this one keeps popping up. The Xanax is popping up in, in those combinations where we're seeing the, uh, uh, the cases that are resulting up. Year, same thing. Uh, those numbers keep on, keep on climbing. Uh, we're seeing the this cycle, and this is just an example of the cycle of addiction. And it's it's interesting because now, well, we you heard them talk about four of the five coming from prescription drugs transitioning into. Well, this also shows you the hydrocodone to the oxycodone, all the way around to heroin, and now. Uh, we're seeing them transition right back around to pharmaceuticals if they can't get a hold of the other drugs. And then if they can't get a hold of heroin itself, all of the heroin that we're seeing, just about all of it, is being cut or adulterated with some type of fentanyl, fentanyl analog. Again, just a good example. Uh, transition from prescriptions to, uh, to the opioids, you heard this one. These are just some of the seizures across the state just within the last short period of time. This is a counterfeit pill lab in Memphis, Tennessee. There was four of those presses, commercial presses. They were producing and capable of producing 10,000 pills an hour. And we did seize a significant quantity over a kilo, kilogram of fentanyl uh, out of that lab as well. The middle seizure that you see here, that's 10 kilograms of fentanyl. That was on I-40, just uh, between Memphis and Nashville that we did seize off of the road. That's Guys, that's huge. You want to talk about weapons of mass destruction. You want to talk about something that will kill uh, easily a million people right there. That 10 kilograms of fentanyl, acetyl fentanyl, car fentanyl, will, will, will gladly do it. This seizure here, this is car fentanyl. And this was uh, last week over in Memphis. And it, while it was only six ounces of car fentanyl that we seized, that six ounces of carfentanil, you're talking about something that's 10,000 times more powerful than morphine. And my best example, uh, my best example to give you a good idea, all the time when we're talking about the, the stimulants, and yes, we are also seeing the increase in stimulants, our methamphetamine and our cocaine have never been higher. And cocaine's coming back with a vengeance. The Colombians are back in the game, and they're making it quite known that they are back in the game to stay. And so our cocaine and our methamphetamine coming over are back out of vengeance. These are not only particular problems for you in doing pill counts and to the public because they're so potent and they're so lethal, and the euphoric effect between the optimum euphoria that they're looking for, which is about 125 micrograms, and 125 micrograms is about the equivalence. So I'm looking at a sugar pack. This is a gram. Well, the first and foremost, I tell you, that's what we're looking at most things, cocaine, methamphetamine, we're all measuring it by grams. That, for all intensive purposes, is about $100, 100 150 depending on the potency or the purity of it. Number one, make no mistake about it, that one gram is not one use. You're looking at about a third of that or a quarter of the gram, and that's, that's, a, that's a person that's developed quite the tolerance to use a quarter of a gram 
of cocaine or methamphetamine, either which way. So that's pretty good tolerance. And that uh, would be multiple uses. So a person possessing or someone having uh, a gram could be multiple, and it could even be resale amounts. So two things about that. If you come in and you pick out two particulates of that, the average particulate, uh, grain of salt particulate, is 0 0.60 micrograms. So you take two micrograms, or two granules of salt, is about the equivalent of the optimum euphoric effect of acetyl fentanyl. That's what they're looking for. And my understanding is, is <clears throat> that the same time you get that optimum effect for the euphoric effect, is also when it kicks in and it's uh, respiratory de uh, uh, depression and that's when you start developing some real issues there. So 0.25 is a good thing, uh, close to death but not quite there unless you're naive and then 0 0.3130 is a lethal amount or lethal dose and the two particulates of that is enough to overdose me, 6'2", 248 pounds. If I move over to a carfentanil, uh, or some of the other that we're seeing, some of the other analogs, U4477 is a new one that we've just, we're trying to regulate, we're trying to get control. If it's a carfentanil, then I'm looking at, you can see the, the dollar bill there, I'm looking at one particulate is enough. The other issues is that can be, it can, it can be airborne and it can be transdermal. So we've got a lot of issues with law enforcement with you absorbing it under the right conditions you could uh, and it's obviously a lethal a lethal dose the other thing is it's all about the money and the profits of it if i'm chasing kilos i promise you you see the 10 kilograms it's much easier for our law enforcement to detect 10 kilograms or a thousand pounds we can we're pretty doggone good about intercepting something like that but when i'm talking about something the size of this and a half, if I get this and a half, that is enough or the same potency. It could be an equal replacement for more than uh, almost two kilograms of that heroin. So two kilograms, I can get the same potency or the equivalents out of two grams amounts. So it's being shipped in from, uh, been manufactured in makeshift labs over in China and being shipped into the United States most of it's postal or UPS, FedEx. We get a lot of it that way. And that six micrograms is a lot, is, is a lot for us to deal with. Uh, these are just some of the street terminologies that you'll see. The reason I show this is because every time we get a hold of one of these and we regulate it, the, this, the molecular structure of this is so easy that they just simply change it up and move an oxygen group or a hydrogen group over to the other side and as soon as they do that, it's outside of our analog control groups. And so long, it's no longer a controlled substance. And we know of, a, of identified 130 different ways that they can molecularly change this thing. So guys, we're always going to play catch up. We're not going to be able to get ahead of this, and we don't think. These are the medicinal, when everybody says fentanyl, everybody, most are thinking about diverted fentanyl, pharmaceutical grade fentanyl, and the lollipop or the pain patch. While we do see some diversion of that, it's not, it's, it's insignificant compared to the other fentanyls that we're dealing with. This is an example of what I was showing you a minute ago. Uh, <clears throat> again, lethal dose amounts of heroin versus acetylfentanyl versus carfentanyl, and it's just the one particulate there in the middle that you can see. Uh, cheap, easy, analogs. The analogs are going to be here. Analogs also, again, what we are considering from law enforcement and first responders, if it's a white powder substance, we are now treating as, it, as, as fentanyl. We have detected in our crime labs fentanyl, uh, we've, I'll give you an example, a, a scary example to us. Is we had about uh, had a case uh, identified as uh, 50, 43 kilos of cocaine intercepted coming across the border, destined for Tennessee. We set up the deal to, to do the transaction with DEA, uh, assisting DEA in it. We get it up to Tennessee. 
The deal didn't go. We take it back down to Atlanta. We get down to Atlanta. The deal goes. We submit the drugs to the crime lab like we would normally do it. The crime lab calls back a couple of days later and says, we've got a little problem with that. We said, what's the problem? So, well, that wasn't cocaine. We said, what was it? So that was 46 kilos of fentanyl. You don't think our pucker factor didn't go up? Here we are running around with 46 kilograms of fentanyl, and this is... Uh, so it does, and there have been some exposures to it. And the other, he was talking about the Narcan. I mean, not only are we having to, we're, we got more and more agencies across the state making Narcan available to law enforcement, first responders, and we're using a lot more of it. But we're also not only using it for the public and having it available for those that are making calls, but we also have to have it available for our first responders for, for accidental overdoses. And the other issue with that, is uh, you don't have enough. You may not have enough on hand to handle uh, the exposure if it's just a relatively small amount, especially with one of these high potent forms, or if it's a research drug, a U4477, then the Narcan's not even gonna work at all. Profit mode at counterfeit, uh, there's just a lot, of, a lot of money that can be made to it, and we're talking about dollars and cents. These are a couple of the examples you can see. Guys, the pills that this is a seizure in Nashville uh, where they were making fake Percocets. We had 18 overdose deaths in one weekend in Murfreesboro related to this and an additional eight overdoses in Nashville before we took this, before we took this down. You can see the uh, uh, went down. This was actually a Nashville Metro TBI and DEA case. That's a kilo and a half of a mixture containing uh, fentanyl. And these are the binders, and this is also, this is a pill press right here. We've seized, I think, between us, Homeland Security, law enforcement across the state in the last year, six of these counterfeit pill labs. So the good thing is, is you're, we're doing a much better job um, in the prescription drug arena by reducing the diversion of pharmaceuticals. And I guess seeing this pop up on the illicit side or the, the, the criminal side is, uh, it's a validation of your efforts. You're doing a much better job. And listen, I'm not complaining. I would much rather, even though this is very dangerous, I'd much rather see it out here than being diverted from, from health care. <clears throat> it is very costly for us. I do want to point out uh, just the response. It takes, uh, this is a level A certification for law enforcement. We have to send guys in and these are all disposable suits and just that response right there is uh, going to add up to about a $65,000 response is what it would cost us. And that's not addressing the residents where the residence itself would have to be decontaminated. And we didn't have a mechanism, even on this residence that you're seeing behind. What we ended up having to do is because our meth quarantine statutes do not apply, we had to go back to health. And it was the first time in the state's history that I'm aware of that we were able to go in and do a health quarantine because of uh, the potential and the potency of this drug to actually have the house uh, tested and remediated. So it's costly all the way around to anybody that's, uh, that's in, involved in it. Again, another example of the pill presses. This is uh, crude examples, and you can see these are... We're seeing all types. Again, we've detected uh, the fentanyl in uh, methamphetamine, in cocaine, in Xanax. They'll cut anything and everything with it. And this is it coming into our crime lab. <clears throat> the potential for the profit, if you're looking at 1.5 milligrams, that could be 666,000 pills. $10 a pill, that's potentially 6.6 .6 million. Price per pill, $20 a pill. One milligram. You can see it's a very profitable thing, and you could have even had an original investment of about $360. You can make the purchase and, and bring it in. And it's so, uh, there's no way using domestic equipment, there's no way for you to blend that into anything with any degree of accuracy. So it's just Russian roulette. But the other thing that we're seeing is we, you would think that when we put the public notices out there and tell them, the 18 overdose deaths that we had in Murfreesboro. We were in the middle of that investigation when we had the 18 overdose deaths. We already had these guys identified, and we're trying to build a case on them. 
So when we had the 18 overdose deaths over the weekend, guys, we had to stop. That's a deal changer. That's a game changer. We've got to go out there. It's a public health issue. We teamed up with health, mental health, substance, and, and Nash Metro, and we put out a public warning. We thought putting out that public alert that it would damage our investigation. What do you think? The next day we were, we were buying, the next day, and our dealer that we were buying from tells us, be careful, this is potent shit. I don't want to lose you like I lost those other customers. Guys, they are looking for this, and they will, they will seek this drug out knowing that somebody just overdosed. And we put it out and said, listen, you can't handle this. No, no, I can handle it. I want some of that good stuff. I want the hot stuff. That's what I'm looking for. And it's Russian roulette. I mean, it literally is Russian roulette. And it doesn't matter what their tolerance is. If you've got two grains or two specks on that side of the pill, then it's just going to be a lethal, uh, a lethal dose. Uh, just some of the programs that we've got. Uh, Dr. Best said something earlier about the pill take back. You know, we've been doing, and Tennessee has done a number of things. Uh, DEA has the national pill take back events, which run two a year. And then Tennessee implemented a permanent pill take back program, which we have 227 permanent pill take back boxes and locations across the state. Sheriff's Office, police departments, we're working with our anti-drug coalitions, mental health and substance abuse, Department of Environment, trying to get those unused, unwanted pills out of the medicine cabinets, bring them to us, we'll get rid of them, we'll dispose of them for you. We have said every year that this take-back program is going on, well, we're going to get ahead of it. We're going to get ahead of it. And it's going to go down. It's going to go down. Every year that we've done this program, what's happened? It's gone up. And even this, we're finishing up. We, we, all the trucks left today. We don't have all the numbers in. Uh, I can tell you we, had, we, we collected over between 600 and 900 barrels is what we filled up of pills. And we think our weights are going to be somewhere between 24,000 and 27,000 pounds just for Tennessee in this one pill take back event this past weekend. The numbers are still staggering. It's a good problem to have that we disposed of so many drugs, and this is just some of the examples, but it just tells you just how many drugs that are out there. Uh, since April of last year, up until this, prior to this pill take back, we collected and disposed of 53,270 pounds of pills. That is all I have. I'm, I wrapped it up very fast and turn it over to Dr. Mutter.